<laughs> hey, welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse. Today, our panel is going to discuss Rush Instrumentals. So what we're going to do is each go around, we'll go eight, seven, six, and we'll just kind of rotate around. And we'll uh, start with our number eight. We'll discuss it. And we'll go from there. But I don't know about you guys, but this is probably one of the most difficult preparations I've had to do. Yeah, I think they're all good. I had to be like really picky to even have a bottom. My, my order kept changing around. Yeah, I kind of knew what my number one and number two, but a lot of the other ones kind of shifted around. And I've been listening to these for a couple of weeks. I'm just going to let it go by the seat of my pants. So that's, that's how I'm just going to make well, it John, up. John, that's line. what I like about you. You just let it go. <laughs> and just, we just take it as it comes. So that's what yeah. we're going to do. And I think we'll start out. I don't know. Let's go John, Ryan, Todd, and then me. And we'll just keep going. So John, since you're flying by the seat of your pants, <laughs> let's start with your number eight. Oh, okay. So, uh, all right. I guess I'm going to go. It, this is a tough one because all all eight of these are really all very good. Um, I think my bottom my bottom one is probably going to be "Where's My Thing" Part Four, a Gangster of Boats trilogy from the Roll the Bones album. Um, and even then, I'm really I'm, it's kind of hard for me to put this at the bottom because I really like that funky beat to it, and I like I you know I, I it's a very good song. I mean the, the band is just all of these songs, the band's just locked in hard and it is just great grooves and it's just a great showcase for everybody. So it's, this is for, this is to rank is actually going to be really tough for me. So, but I'm going to say, I'm just going to say, where's my thing part four to start it off. All right. Um, yeah, I, my, my number eight, also a very good track. I just had to go with it because it's like the least, involved track of the eight so my number eight is going to be hope from snakes and arrows i think it's a beautiful track it's mostly acoustic but i think compared to the rest of them that have so much versatility and so much energy to them it just ended up coming last for me but it's still really good there you go can't argue with that todd what do you got all right, my number eight is Malignant Narcissism off of Snakes and Arrows. Um, I like the track. It, 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 it's one of the shorter ones, and I, I like uh, the way I, I like the way it, it really drives. It's got a really good uh, energy to it. Um, but I think it works better as a transition between Good News First and We Hold On rather than on its own. But uh, and so my something had to be last track is. Malignant narcissism, which is great. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, right. all these tracks are great. You got to put them somewhere. So I'm going to be like Ryan, and I'm going my number eight's Hope off Snakes and Arrows from 2007. Great acoustic guitar piece from Alex. You cannot argue with that. Anytime you get Alex on a classical guitar or a, an acoustic guitar, it's a gift. And I think clocking in at two minutes i think it could have been a little longer i mean i like to would have heard more but i will i will take the two minutes and that's my number eight on to number seven all right my number seven is gonna be i figured since i was started with where's my thing or what's my thing um was it what's my thing or where's my thing anyway it's where i'm gonna leave thing. that thing alone <laughs> Where's my thing? So, so I'm going to leave that thing alone as number seven. Again, I mean, it's pretty much like a sequel to, uh, to Where's My Thing. Still a great track, uh, but I, I, I think they kind of just go hand in hand to me. So I'm going to leave. The, I'm going to put that one at number seven. Um, so my number seven is actually going to be Where's My Thing. I think it's an interesting track. It's very funky. And I love funk. But the one thing that gets me with this track and why it ranks so low is I don't really like that like early 1990s production on it. Kind of has a little bit of Red Hot Chili Peppers bass to it. And it just seems a little annoying on a Rush track, but still a tremendous song. Great guitar parts, great bass and great drums. It's 
it's fantastic, but that little nitpick is what got it to be my number seven. See, I didn't find that so much on that song, that whole production aspect. Yeah, that's I just thought... what I heard with it. Like, I think it's, I think Roll the Bones as a whole is a pretty cool album, but when I kept listening back to these tracks, that was the one thing that I thought every single time this one came on. Eh, I wish the production wasn't so dated on it. Hmm. Interesting. All right. I accept I accept that, Ryan. Cool. I don't like <laughs> it, but I accept it. Todd, what do All you right. got? My number seven is Hope. And I, main, I mainly put it at number seven because I didn't want to put it at number eight because it would have been easy to do that since it's not the whole band playing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I like it a lot. I wish it were longer, but it had been a long time since we really heard, you know, Alex just play the acoustic guitar. And so it was a nice treat. And I think the melody is really beautiful. Um, so I'm going with Hope. Excellent choice. Uh, my number seven is Limbo from Test for Echo in 1997. When I listen to this, I don't think it's quite as memorable as some of the other tracks that they produced. It sounds like maybe the bands, um, I don't want to say it like they're jamming, but it seems like they're trying out different song structures. I don't know. I think it's fine. It does have vocals from Getty throughout the track. He doesn't really sing anything, but it's just kind of out there in the atmosphere. Kind of mm -hmm. like they're using his voice as a musical instrument of some sort. You know, it was 1997. Hell, it could have been a sample for all we know. Um, it's kind of like, you know, kind of reminds me of 10CC, you know, and that kind of, not really, but, you know, for some reason, 10CC yeah. popped into my head. I think it's a pleasant listen. Um, but there, like I said, there are more, there are more instrumentals that are more memorable. And the other thing in my research, there's spoken samples on here from Bobby Boris Pickett. The Monster Mash. I did read that, yes. I read that, and I thought, well, I'll be damned. I'm sorry something with the Monster Mash ranks so low for me, but if the music would be a little bit more memorable, I even hate to critique it because, you know, Rush is such a powerhouse of instrumental machinery. I hate to even say that, but number seven's Limbo. Yeah. So one more thing I want to add about Leave That Thing Alone, to me, I felt was it was it was perfect on Counterparts because it was it it Counterparts was kind of this a much more heavier album. And that I mean, one you, was you said and that one was certainly heavier than than Where's My Sight. So I wanted to oh, add that okay. about Leave That Thing Alone. So I just I'm one gotcha. thing I had meant to meant to throw in there. So my number six is Limbo. Um, I like the drive. I think it's a. I think the the vocal thing kind of is nice. Uh, nice to throw in there. Um, I thought that was a pretty good track. Again, uh, just again, you can't go wrong with these the, these songs, and it's just hard to really pick them apart. But yeah, there. I thought this was a strong track, a good driving track. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, my number six was the main monkey business off of snakes and arrows um really cool track it's pretty heavy guitar wise but i just think the track isn't very memorable i got kind of bored listening to it it's like six minutes long and it just it didn't really justify its length for me i think a song that we're going to talk about later off of that album kind of honed in being a bit more concise better and i also think that because the guitar was so heavy on this one it kind of took my interest my attention away from some of the other instruments, which I think was a little bit of a fault to this one because so many of the other instrumentals are great combinations mm -hmm. of all three instruments. And I didn't feel as much with this one, but still really cool. I mean, it made it my number six. So it's a rush, you know, it's a rush. <laughs> Nothing bad here. No. <laughs> well, my number six is also the main monkey business from snakes and arrows. And sorry to put, all my last three off the same album. Sorry, Rush. I, I don't, I'm not making a comment about the album. Um, this actually swapped places with my number five just a, a little while ago. Um, <laughs> I agree with, uh, with Ryan. It's, it's a little too long, um, but I do like the acoustic guitar being thrown into the mix. 
And that was something that they sort of did on this album through the whole thing. Even, even on the heavier songs, there's some acoustic in there as well. And uh, I like that. Um, I like a little more synth in my Rush instrumentals. So mm. the ones from this album came out, came in at eight, seven, and six. Well, I do have to say on Snakes and Arrows, I really like the way that record sounds. It is good. Sound. Engineering is great. Before Which I think I is interesting because same team did Clockwork Angels, and I don't think Clockwork Angels sounds as good. No. I think it's a better album, but I don't think it sounds as good. I w put my headphones on and I walked the dog before he did this, so I went through all the tracks again. And that's the thing that I thought. I thought, man, Snakes and Arrows just really kicks. Yeah. I love the sound of it. Sounds good. And I think that just helps those instrumentals. So that leads into my number six malignant narcissism from snakes and arrows in 2007 um this is where i think think things start picking up and what i do find that's interesting about this record when i'm comparing like this the it seems like this song has a similar tonality as to limbo and limbo is 10 years later but 10 years i mean sorry limbo is 10 years earlier but for some reason, when you play these back to back, for some reason, when my, my phone was playing, I'm it kind of put these together and I'm going, well, they're not that much different. Um, but what I like about Malignant Narcissism is that the bass takes center stage. The musical interludes that Getty and Neil have, a la YYZ, you got to love it. I mean... I could have more of that, you know? So this kind of reminds me of YYZ, YYZ, whatever you want to call it, whatever country you're in. I love the playing. I love the bass sound. I love the guitar sound. And like I said, I love the sound of Snakes and Arrows. So I'm putting that at number six. Nice. Number right. five, John. Number five. So mine, uh, so mine's going to be where uh, Todd's bottom three were from Snakes and Arrows. Well, I guess I might as well start my trend. So main monkey business for me, number five. Um, it's a great, it is a great track. I love the driving beat of it. Um, it is, you're right. It is a little long, but, uh, but I don't feel like it meanders. It, it, it just, it, I think it's a great, it just, there's a lot of good parts, a lot of good showcase in there. I think it fits after listening through the record. I think it kind of does fit fairly good in there for me. And again, I, I I was listening to it with headphones. Uh, the few times I was listening to the, the playlist I made, I'm just like, wow, this is just, yeah, just amazing. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Main Monkey Business. Cool. There you go. Um, my number five is actually gonna be Malignant Narcissism. Um, you know, I I think that the the instrumentals on Snakes and Arrows were not quite as impressive to me as some of the other ones that we're going to talk about. I think they were really good. And this was definitely the best one. It was concise. It was like two minutes long. Uh, I think it got brought up on episode we did recently, actually about short songs, but. Um, oh yeah, I did that. Yeah. So uh, I think in that two minutes, it packs in a lot though. It's super heavy, great rhythm section great guitar i mean i think alex sounds fantastic on this and alex sounds amazing on all these actually such an underrated and amazing guitar player um but yeah. yeah i think this is a good one i think it sounds amazing like grant said i do think all three tracks on snakes and arrows sounded excellent but yeah i like that this one's concise and it has a bit more going on than hope so that's why it's my number five today Good choice. All right. Good choice. My uh, number five is uh, Limbo from uh, Tess Freco. Um, It started out as my number eight, and then it moved into number six, and then it overtook <laughs> Main Monkey Business. Well, this ought to um, be good, because that was, it was my number seven, Todd. <laughs> That's a heck of a leap, Rob. That's a heck of a yeah. leap. Well, this well, better well, be good. Here's, here, here's the thing about Tess Freco. I have a very difficult relationship with Tess Freco, because when it came out, it was really the first one where they really 
buried the keyboards. And when I first heard it in 1996, I mean, they had a lot to compete with. Grunge had already happened. I, I don't think they were 100% positive what direction they wanted to go in. But I don't think just having keyboards and just kind of burying them in the mix is really a good, uh, it doesn't seem like a very uh, direct uh, approach. So my, my first impression when I heard Tesfereco was great, where's the rest of it? So, <laughs> you know, where are the rest of the parts? But uh, I have really warmed up to it in the last couple of years. And uh, Limbo, I just felt like had, was it was a better song overall, overall than the three that uh, instrumentals from uh, Snakes and Arrows. And one of the things that I, I like the vocal part on it, and I just thought it, I thought it held together a little better. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to, no to, to note is that I feel like my last four, my five, six, seven, and eight, are all songs to me that sound like they could have been regular songs. There's just no vocal parts. Whereas one, two, three, and four sound that, like more like they are deliberate instrumentals. So hey, that's kind of, and point. this is kind of where I put the mm -hmm. dividing line. I think Limbo could have been a song, but it, it just doesn't have any vocals. <laughs> yes. So uh, that's just how I hear it. So that's my number five. Well, it's a good point. Well, my number five is uh, Leave That Thing Alone from Counterparts in 1993. It's got pump popping and pumping. It's got pop and funk bass riffs. The, the thing almost in a, maybe another time period, I could almost transpose this song over to be a, a surf guitar instrumental. I don't know why it makes me think of a surf guitar instrumental, but it does. Alex Lifeson, I think, just shines on this track. I mean, it's reminiscent of 80s Rush, um, and which is kind of, well, you know, think about it. It's not that far off from the 80s, but it sound, reminds me more of like early 80s Rush for some reason. I don't know. But the, the, the popping funk bass riffs, I love it. I mean, did I mention the bass on this? It's killer. Did I talk about the bass? <laughs> Just saying, I love all it. about that bass. It the, is. Best, man. <laughs> and the thing about this, the, the keyboards on this are more like an embellishment. You don't really kind of notice it. Um, I mean, it's nice. It's not annoying. It's not overpowering. It's not. I don't know. I'm I'm all about the bass. So uh, this is my number five. Leave that thing alone. I love it. Of course, I like them all, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Number Go four ahead. for me. Yes. I'm just going to jump right in and really, really throw it all off. Malignant uh, narcissism. Um, you know, I, I read that that was uh, actually nominated for, uh, for a Grammy. For instru uh, rock <clears throat> instrumental, I believe it was. It was. Yeah. I forgot uh, about that. And yeah. and it lost to it lost to Bruce Springsteen of all things. <laughs> I. Anyway, well, you know Bruce is a true artist. Yeah. Influential. Anyway, so yeah, it's the only thing I the only thing I don't like about malignant narcissism is it's it's too short. You know, it's like ah, two minutes and twenty seconds or whatever. It's like oh man, give me more, give me more. This is such a this is such a great track. I just, you guys have said a lot about it already. Uh, just to know, I just, I love, I just love everything about that track. And, and, and again, I think it's kind of a nice kind of lead into that last track on snakes and arrows. Cause it's just, it just works so well. So yeah. Malignant narcissism for me for number four. It's yeah. excellent. Excellent choice. All right, Ryan, what's up? So my number four is actually going to be Leave That Thing Alone from Counterparts. I love this song. It's super groovy. Great. That bass, you know, it's just such good bass. Um, but I also love the guitar. The tone is so good. It's like full of reverb, real lush sounding. It just, it's such a moody track. I think that... Um, it definitely just makes it has like kind of a melancholy feel to it relaxing but still groovy like i can move to it and i don't know it's just really well done i think that it does fit 
well as an instrumental because Alex's guitar parts on it basically are like vocals of their own. And yeah, I think production wise, it's one of my favorite sounding Russian instrumentals. It just takes me to another world. Kind of has like a production feel of like some like 80s indie music, like in some ways, like full of the reverb and stuff. Mm -hmm. It, I don't know. It's just, it's a weird one. I, I really like it. And I love Counterparts. I think that was an awesome album. Yeah, yeah I like yeah. that record. Great album. Definitely. Yep. All right. Well, my number four is Leave That Thing Alone. And uh, one of the things that it has going for it to make it so high on the list is that it is that it comes right after Double Agent, which is a uh, top five Rush song for me. So uh, <laughs> I think this album sounds really good. I think it's in the running for best sounding Rush album. I, I'm not sure what that is, but this is one of the contenders. Mm -hmm. um, I love the way it sounds. I love the, the occasional electronic drum tossed in there where he kind of makes that sound that uh, kind of yeah. throws it in the, in the mix and the bass. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that this might be higher, but it's number four. It's that popping funk bass. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes it so good. Excellent choice, because I agree with you there. Though I rated it lower, which I can't believe that, but whatever, it's good. All right, we're on to number four. Am I right? Is that right? Number four? Yeah. All right, my number four is off of Snakes and Arrows from 2007. The main monkey business. I think this is six minutes of instrumental bliss, boys. Instrumental bliss. It's a bit more rocking than some of the other instrumentals. Guitars, you know, more at the forefront. Uh, and I noticed that there's a little bit of acoustic, acousticness from Alex, like a la hope. Have you noticed that? I don't know if it's. I'd have to A, B him closer, but I swear to God, some of that from Hope is actually into this track. Could be, I could be wrong, but you got a great guitar solo towards the middle of the track. I mean, Alex Lifes, and this is one of his best moments, I think, on any of these instrumentals. And as we talked about, I think Alex needs to get more love. I think his guitar playing is just inspirational and always entertaining you never quite know i mean if you've seen alec if you've seen rush live you never quite know what to expect i mean he kind of keeps within the same realm of the track and stuff but god he's such a he's such a beautiful player he has some of the best tone ever too the tone not, but dude. his tone like you know permanent waves and moving pictures when he was like using this 345 through like a marshall or something that's the stuff I like. I think that era, he had the best guitar tone. So I'm getting totally off track. But um, it's almost kind of proggy. I don't, I don't know. I kind of hear a little bit of progginess on it. And this song also has Getty kind of floating above everything, doing some kind of vocalization that could be maybe a sample i don't know but he's making that kind of the boris you know we don't we don't have uh the monster mash in this one so i'm kind i'm surprised i rated it so high because if this would have had something like from young frankenstein or something i might have you know really might have put it at number one but we don't have that um but it's beautiful it's rocking it's alex lifeson at his best and it's my number four. John, what do you got? Okay, so my number three, I'm going to complete the Snakes and Arrows trilogy here. And I know that I know this ranks higher than what you guys were doing, but uh, I absolutely love Hope. That just is two minutes of just acoustic mm -hmm. bliss. Uh, 12 string, D, D modal tuning. You know, for the guitar players out there tuned to D A D A A D, uh, you know, I I love a lot of the I I love solo acoustic pieces. You know, from from whether it's Jimmy Page or Steve Howe, or any of the Shredders or what you know, whenever they decide to do something acoustic, Al Di Miola. Anytime they do stuff like this, I'm a sucker for it. This thing was just this thing was just two minutes of absolute beauty. 
again, I could have listened to this for another 20 minutes or something, and I think I would have been fine with it. But uh, yeah, so I know this is, but I guess, you know, the guitar player in me just had to put that one a little higher because I just, I'm a sucker for it. So, I mean, I totally get it. I, but I agree. I think it could have been a little bit longer. Yeah. But it's, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't put, I, I almost wanted to put this at the bottom, but I'm like, no, I can't. I, I just oh, love I get this thing it. too much. Now I feel so. guilt that I put it at the bottom and Ryan should <laughs> feel guilty too. No, no, but I just, that's just me. Ryan, do you feel guilty about that? No, but I might feel guilty about my number three. Uh oh. Well, <laughs> by this all is means, be Ryan, take you. It's your floor. Go ahead. I'd love to hear your number three. So, my number three is La Villa Strangiato. Um, amazing track. I think that for me personally it shows a lot it's the last rush album for me where songwriting wise the song feels long to be long i think it's excellent i think there's a lot of great parts in it including some of alex's greatest guitar playing ever but at points, it's a little too repetitive for me. And I think that's something that I notice once in a while in early Rush is that I don't know if they just needed to grow a little more songwriting wise in their early years, but sometimes they do things that feel too repetitive. And I don't know, it just, it comes off as a little weak to me. And there's a couple of moments in this song that's like that. But the reason why it's my number three though you have the amazing acoustic guitar playing at the beginning. You have an amazing rhythm section throughout the whole time, especially when Alex does his solo, which is fantastic, like right in, near the beginning of the song. Mm -hmm. Such an amazing solo. And um, the Getty and Neil sound amazing behind it, too. And then when Alex does some of those like, heavy metal guitar riffs like <laughs> in the latter half of the song it's just awesome but i think some of them go on a little too long and so that's why that's my number three today amazing track but i think that for me once permanent waves hit that album through grace under pressure showed the band at their best sound songwriting wise even though Farewell is my favorite Rush album. I think R Hemispheres was a little bit of a drop for me after Farewell, just because I thought the songwriting was stronger on Hemispheres. And I think this is one that I see that in. Wait a minute, you thought the songwriting was better on a Farewell to Kings? Yes, yes. That's okay, not mean. Hemispheres, okay. It was better on <clears throat> Farewell. Just want to make sure. Yeah. Well, Ryan, you're wrong, but okay, it's okay. <laughs> Nice to hear what you had to say. <laughs> well, well, Ryan, Todd, I agree. With what, you about what do you the, got? I agree with Ryan about the length, and I think if you were to ask uh, Getty and Alex, they might agree because I think if you look at where the instrumentals went after that, I think they 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 wanted to to tighten things up as well. Yeah, uh, my my number three is "Where's My Thing," Part Four, the Gangster of Boats trilogy. Um, the reason I love this song is because the of the of the the synth part and the way that it has a sound effect on it it kind of goes I, re I really like that i can't really do i can't really reproduce it but it's got a sonic whoosh about it that i think is really innovative and i think that roll the bones is really probably the last time rush really tried to innovate on the keyboards and uh i i just think it's a really great effect and uh I also like the percussive, really clean sounding guitar at the beginning. And uh, I think it's a good track. I think it's really interesting. I think when you think about how everybody talks about the, you know, the, the, the most popular Rush uh, uh, instrumentals, I feel like this is the one that comes closest to it because I think musically it's really interesting. And it really sounds like an intentional instrumental to me. And so... For that reason, I have it at number 
Todd, I've always liked you, and I totally agree with what you're saying. And my number three is also Where's My Thing from Roll, Roll the Bones, 1991. Funky, it's kind of proggy. I think it sounds awesome. This is the song that I was listening to in the car, and I'm going, man, does this song just kick? It's lively. It sounds great. There's a lot of energy. I agree that I totally think this was an instrumental track that they wrote to be an instrumental track. I totally think that's the true. Um, this is, and the bass is, Getty's bass playing on this, is, I think, is the star on this track. This is like the first instrumental they had in 10 years. I don't know why they quit doing instrumentals for such a long time, but I'm glad they started it up. The other star of this show on this, I think it's the drums. The drums are really well, well recorded. I mean, it almost kind of reminds me of that drum sound from moving pictures to some degree, only it's a little bit cleaner. This song is almost up there with YYZ or YYZ if I was going to choose that. But I think maybe a lot of people kind of base all the instrumentals off of that. You know, it's always been a concert favorite and blah, 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 blah. But uh, the drums are killer. The sound is great. The energy's great. The bass is just phenomenal. And uh, for three minutes and 49 se seconds, it just totally cooks. That's my number three. You know, I actually wanted to say something real quick about okay. the engineering on that mm -hmm. track, because uh, people talk a lot about the way Presto and Roll the Bones sounds because of Rupert Hines' uh, mix. Mm -hmm. um, the drums maybe sound a little thinner than what you're used to hearing from Rush, but they're really clean. And everything else is really clean. Right. Sonically, the songs from those two albums, I think, sparkle a little bit. And, uh, and where's my thing, I think, does that. I'm just, maybe that's what I mean. They're very clean. You can hear everything. Everything stands out. And it's not and Not everybody buried. likes that, but I like that. It's okay. But you know, the other thing is, I'm not sure, but was Roll the Bones recorded digitally? I think it might have been. It sounds like it. I think it was. I mean, it's not warm like moving pictures or any of the Terry Brown productions. Yeah. It's not That's warm. What I mean. yeah. So I'm wondering, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think that might have been a digital recording. Can you tell, Todd? I'll look it up. Hang on. But anyway, that's my number three. So now we're on why Todd's looking it up. He's almost there. Now now I have to decide which, which one's going to be number two and which one's going to be number one. I can't. Well, I was in the <laughs> same dilemma as you. In fact, mine could change. <clears throat> oh, I think, I think mine's changed about six times in, in the last five minutes. Um, what do you got? Did you find it? Uh, no, it doesn't say. I'll be damned. I bet you it's <laughs> digital. It sounds like it. I think it probably is. All right, John. Well, that should have given you enough time to decide. What's okay. your number two? I think writing from hope with its beginning. I, I'm going to, uh, this time I'm going to say La Via Strangiato as my number two. Um, it was it was my number one, but then it kind of went to number two. One, I don't know. I love Alex's beginning. That just that little speedy little uh, Spanish guitar, you know, flamenco thing. I love that. I love the guitar solo about the six minute mark. I love those driving riffs toward the end at the da 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 da. I just. At, there's just so much good stuff about that song, and I, 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 uh, I really wanted to put that as number one, but I have, I think I have more story and history with my number one. So, La Via Strangiato, it is. It's my number two. Can't argue with that, Ryan. What you got? So my number two is Limbo from Testereco. Mm -hmm. um, I just love this song. It's super noisy with the guitars especially there's a lot of distortion on it but i think that you still get to hear the bass and the drums really well 
I think that intro is super impressive, especially the way they all coexist together. I mean, the drumming is kind of like jazzy sounding on it. The bass is really strong. And you have Alex's really heavy guitar tone. Then throughout, you do have Getty's voice being used as like an instrument. And I think mm -hmm. that makes it even moodier. And really, really interesting to me. Uh, I think this is probably the most atmospheric track that we're going to talk about with maybe my number one being the only one that would beat it. Um, but I also like that they facilitate some of the like guitar strumming, like just a chord, like, you know, kind of like your classic, like sound in that moving pictures through grace mm -hmm. under pressure kind of era that really like nice ringing out guitar chords that I just love in a rush song. Uh, it is like five minutes long, but this one doesn't feel too long to me just because it has a lot going on. I think having a little bit of vocals in it maybe makes that length a little bit easier to swallow. But I just, I love this track. I mean, I didn't really expect it to be my number two, but as I kept listening through the tracks, it's the one that ended up making it for me. I mean, I can't argue with that. How, how what's your feelings on the monster match being included in that? Love it. <laughs> There you go. Is number two. What's not to like? <laughs> well, you have to laugh because it is kind of funny that it's in there. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. You got to love it. And I can't argue with that. I think that's a good number two. I mean, I rated mine lower than that, but doesn't mean I don't, you know, I, I love all this stuff. Yeah. All eight of these are great songs. They're all great. Definitely. I guess if we put a mall at number one, that would have made a really short video. It would have been. <laughs> They're all tied for number one. <laughs> well, Todd, you're up. And it's, all right. I know it's one of these two songs. <laughs> um, well, my number two is Lavilla Strato. And uh, so when this came out, it was 1978, I was 14 mm -hmm. years old. And there's something about Lavilla Strato that appeals to 14 year olds, 15 year olds, 16 year olds. When you're first <laughs> discovering progressive rock, it was just the coolest thing ever starting with Alex's solo and then that 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 goofy da -da 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 at the end I mean it was just so it was so much fun and that was you know everybody's favorite part of course uh because it was it was a really long prog instrumental but it has a playful part in it so uh I give it big points for that but it's number two yeah I can totally identify that when you're a kid and you, you're listening to that. Mm -hmm. Kind of opens up your world. It totally opened up my world. I remember hearing it at around that age, probably like 13, 14, and being pretty blown away. Yeah. I, mean, I was a huge Rush fan. But I mean, that whole record, the whole Hemispheres album is one of my, well, it's up there as far as in the Rush ranking. We ever did a yeah, ranking? The, the trees was really big in my oh, early my rush days. <laughs> Same. It's easy to like. Yeah. Well, my number two. Like we're, yeah, I could go back and forth. But my number two is going to be YYZ. Ooh. I know. It should be number one. It could be number one, but I mean, what can I say about it? It, I mean, this came out later because I remember Hemispheres coming out and getting that. And when you're like in middle school or whatever, since I'm a thousand years old, um, moving pictures came out later. I mean, I'd already been swept up in the, the whole rush thing. I remember when permanent waves came out, I freaking, I thought that was the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. In fact, if we did a ranking, that's my number one favorite record. But YYZ encompasses everything that makes Rush great. I mean, everyone in the band is represented perfectly on that track. I mean, if an alien dropped down from the planet and said, hey, what's Rush about? You could throw that track on and that might sum it up. I mean, it doesn't have any vocals on it, but I think for the most part, I think people really do consider this a highly ranked track in their catalog. And I can't 
argue with that at all. For the instrumental, I think this is the, even though, you know, I think it's the pinnacle, the, I don't know, it just seems to sum up Rush. I don't even know what to say about it. It's a great, perfect track. I love the sound, I love the production. Terry Brown on here is brilliant. Yeah. And it's some of the best bass playing on the planet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you remember when you were a kid and you heard that? You know, because I was into Chris Squire and all that stuff. And then you heard this. And, you know, Chris Squire and Geddy Lee, of course, are both don't get I don't like either one more than the other. They're both brilliant. But when you're young and you hear the instrumentation on these Rush albums, it still stands up. It is a great track. I never get tired of it. I love it. That's my number two, even though I feel guilty. I feel bad. It should be higher. But like I said, my one and two could flip flop, you know, they're all great. So John, what do you got? So my top one is the intro to 2112. No, uh, no. I, uh, is, well, we, uh, just to let the viewers know, of course, there's hardly any viewers. We <laughs> almost threw in the 2112 overture because some people consider that something on its own. I mean, you know, they play it live and it's just that. Right. But technically it's part of the suite or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I could definitely me, include this in here, but <laughs> it is part of a suite. And I just had to throw people off with it. But no, I think that's no. good. It de- definitely needs to be an honorable mention. And that's my honorable uh, mention. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, obviously, there's only one left, and it's YYZ. Um, my, I had a cousin who had moving pictures and early eighties. I forget what year it was. I actually heard from him, but I remembered borrowing it from him. And I just fell in love with Tom Sawyer and, and red Barchetta. But YYZ was just amazing. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, what is that? You know, it's just amazing track. Um, limelight was also really good. I didn't listen to side two quite as much. And when I did many years later, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just as good as side one. Wind Chun. Oh. All great tracks. Mm-hmm. But but going back to, I mean, for YYZ, I mean, I've got a buddy, Sam, um, and he uh, he's big Neil fan. And um, we uh, we would play, uh, we played together in like a little church thing that we were a part of. Mm-hmm. And we... He could he could play some of YYZ. I, I don't me may have been able to play the whole thing, but and then you get me on guitar who knew a couple bits, but I certainly couldn't play it nowhere near as good as Alex could. So uh and I didn't have a and our the guy who played bass wasn't really into Rush stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get him to play it. So I would have been I would have loved to have been able to jam on that one some more. So uh and and my he was he and my friend Sam was it was always such a big Rush fan because he loved he loved Neil's playing, especially, but um, being a drummer. But yeah, uh, it's just just a great track, just a great showcase for each member. Um, on you know, and even with the little bit of key, you know, sense that got thrown in there. But I mean, the bass is just ridiculous. The the Alex's solo is, is wonderful. I got nothing. I got nothing else. I can't argue. Y Y Z. Yeah. I agree. For me, when I started looking at this list, there was not going to ever be another number one than YYZ. I never went back and forth on what my number one was going to be. Just because this song's one of the greatest Rush songs of all time. Yeah. I mean, the way it starts off with basically silence, with that little like chimes going that, and then it goes straight into the like it's so heavy. And it's so sudden and immediate and just, it's like car crash music, basically. It's like, it just makes you feel like the world's about to end. And, you know, everybody's just together. And then you have that cool, like, and you have Neil doing perfectly what Getty and Alex are doing with his drums. 
And then it goes into the main riff and Getty's guitar. I mean, his Getty's bass playing is just nuts. Like, yeah. One of the best bass lines of all time, you know? And I just think the riffs are super heavy on this one. The rhythm section's nuts. And Alex's guitar solos are so memorable to that. Like all that kind of stuff. It's just, for me, the ultimate rush instrumental. It's only like four minutes long. So it's half of what La Villa Strangiato is, but I think it does a lot more. Um, and I think that it really shows rush in their peak years. I really think that they were stronger songwriters during this time. The record sounded better. I mean, this is one of the best sounding albums and one of the best sounding tracks in their entire catalog. Um, and yeah, I just think they grew up a lot at this point. And they were all better musicians at this point, too. Like, mm-hmm. this song's nuts musically. And it's, like I said, one of my favorites by the band of all time. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, YYZ for me too. Um, first off, I want to say that the synth part, the melodic part right after all the solos is probably a top 10 prog moment. I mean, if you had to like put all the great prog moments Mm -hmm. and gather them all together, I think that's one of them. I think that that is just a magical moment in rush history and in music history. Um, I think I, I like the, uh, the uh during alex's guitar solo the sound of the breaking glass um Mm -hmm. speaking of being a thousand years old uh back do you guys remember if anybody remembers uh david letterman when he used to throw the cards and they would hit the back wall and it would make a breaking glass sound i one of my college roommates used to be able to do that he would pretend to throw the cards during uh, YYZ and it, and it would make it sound like it was hitting exactly the glass <laughs> out and I can't do it I tried That's to do great. it the other day and I'm always late but uh <laughs> but anyway so that has I have a good memory uh attached to that and I also think that uh yeah I also think that if Rush had ever tried to do that again as mm-hmm. far as the way the solos the way they trade off on the solos during the instrumental I think it, they would have just been accused of trying to rip themselves off or repeat it again. So that's, and that's one of the things that I sometimes hear people say, well, their other instrument, their, their newer instrumentals are good, but they never did that again. They never traded off solos like that. I, I don't think they really could have gotten away with doing YYZ too. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, they've I think- only traded off. What was it? What was the track where uh, malignant narcissism where, they get and Neil traded off but yeah there's a little bit of that there's yeah. a little bit but it's not, there's no but it's not like there's three people here these three people are going to play right. solo one two three and then repeat uh so i don't think they could have ever done that but no. i i considered putting la villa Strangiato first but uh mm-hmm. i changed my mind and decided that only yyz could be first yeah i went with la vita Strangiato from hemispheres 1978 i mean the classical guitar, flamenco guitar interlude. Oh, come on. The song kind of has it all. It, ha- it, it has it all. It sounds great. I mean, what can you say about this track that you guys haven't already said? I mean, they are at the height of their powers. Um, it just seems like the whole track just creates this musical landscape that kind of you know, it goes through peaks and uh, I can't, it's just such a complex piece of music. In fact, you probably read about it that when they were recording this, you know, they just had like a real tough time even playing it. It's so complicated, you know? I mean, I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's a good balance of keyboards, guitar, bass, and drums. And I think Alex Lyson's solo is one of his best. And the guitars, the guitar tone, just in general, like we've said, I like this era of Alex Lifeson. This is when his guitar tone was just absolutely stunning. And like I said, the reason I probably chose this is because when we were kids, remember my dad had a Morant stereo, we had a Morant cassette deck, Techniques turntable, and I'd put 
record on and I'd get the cassette in and I would make compilations, you know. We didn't call them mixtapes then. Just a compilation of different stuff. And I had this little Sanyo boom box that I would take and we'd walk me and my buddies. I'd always take my boom box out and we'd go to the park or do whatever. And La Vida Shranjata was on that mixtape. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And we would just listen to it because we were like probably just starting to play guitar and stuff like that. And for when you're young and you hear something like this, that is just so inspirational and the quality of musicianship, you know, and you're young and impressionable. You're listening to this, you're going, holy crap, how are you doing? It's like something alien. And just the fact of uh, Getty's bass parts on it. It's it's almost like it's part it's part of your musical schooling. It is. <laughs> it's and like it's a it's a it's a class and <laughs> how you figure out. It's part of your musical schooling. And this was before YYZ, even though we like YYZ and it made it on my boom box eventually. But this, when you're even younger and it makes such a big impression, I mean, you know, that and a farewell to Kings and 2112, all those records, these were constant and we would play these all the time. And these have such a history with me that, the only one that I could pick for my number one would be La Vida Strangato. Just the history with it, you know? And yeah. I never get tired of it. I know I've said that in other videos, but it almost reminds, now that I'm thinking of another show, uh, songs that you never get tired of. It's probably <laughs> been done, but everybody's list is different. So that would be a fun that would be a fun show you know do like i don't know well look we just went through eight tracks in an hour yeah you could do like a top 10 your favorite tracks you could crank that out pretty fast since we, I, I we all know what we're talking about about la villa Strangiato is that the live versions of this they're not missing anything they're like just as good <laughs> yeah right. as as the as the that's mind blowing too. Yeah. And there are some live tracks that are instrumental that have only been played live. I almost thought of including them, but nah, let's just do studio tracks. Yeah, you could have included Brune's Bane because mm -hmm. it's on an album. I thought about that later, but I think we picked the right eight. But you can also include 2112 Overture in here. Where would I rank it? Let's say I just put it in here for giggles. It would be pretty high. Probably even my number two. I would say, let's say we did include it. We got a couple, we're fine on time. I would just, oh man, I would say it would be probably my number three. Because yeah, same here. The 2112 Overture. Oh. I think that. It'd have whole... to be my, my number three. I think the whole first side of 2112 is absolutely perfect. I mean, I love the whole album. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I think everything on... I don't think there's really many Rush tracks that I dislike from no. the debut album to Grace Under Pressure. Maybe, like, two. I don't even know if there's that many. But that first side, oh, my God. Temple of Syrinx and stuff. Like, <laughs> it's just some of the yeah. best music ever i think grace under pressure is the last great rush album for me it's the last that i really go back to a lot i mean i've I'm, loved grace under pressure i go all the way to counterparts mm -hmm. i mean so, i like them all I but further. i mean yeah, i, I don't love think really bad albums no I think they they're all have... good but my no. last like peak one is grace under pressure it's right. maybe top three rush for me wow that's like, pretty good how that much <laughs> grace but i love signals for me too mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's basically the ru rush doing the police i love it like <laughs> well yeah i mean there's a lot of police elements on moving pictures too because don't is. forget that neil was really into them around that time that's why i love that period of rush i think they learned a lot from other bands of how to become a better band 
Yeah. But I do love the Terry Brown era. Yeah. Because everything changed once Terry left. I mean, Grace Under Pressure isn't that far off from Signals, but he was almost like the, you know, fourth member. He just knew what to do with them and how to produce them. And I don't know. I liked his production style. I don't know what would have happened if they would have kept him, you know, but, you know, nothing ever lasts. So, well, I think I think that you have to uh, you have to think about what Terry Brown said when he decided not to move on with them is basically the songs are getting too weird. They're getting too keyboardy. I I don't agree. So (laughs) I think I think uh, think they had to move on from him. Yeah, I mean. I honestly like the production on Grace more than I like the production on Signals. Hmm. Just me personally, I think it's a warmer album. It's more moody. I like more. the bass pedals. Yeah, yeah. it's excellent. <laughs> but Terry was excellent. He was like their Jack Douglas for that early period of the band. Like, you know, I just, you can't go wrong, but they definitely needed to move on. Although I but think I- that. The production on Power Windows was a little bit concerning at first. I've grown to like it a lot, but... That's my favorite Rush album. Is it? Well, I've really... Gr- when it came out at the time, <clears throat> I just was like, oh. But, you know, one thing One thing about Power Windows is it's got kind of a weird Rush... Like it's got kind of a weird drum sound. And uh, Hold Your Fire has even a, an even weirder drum sound. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> yeah i think they were getting a little lost as to what the drums were supposed to sound like but but uh, uh going back to talking about terry brown i don't i think he laid the foundation i don't think i don't think rush would have had the career they had had they not worked with him and not made those records that they made with him Agreed completely. I agree. even though i think they should have moved on when they did i don't think they would have been where they are it, without him oh well, i'd yeah. still like to hear one more just give me one more <laughs> Yeah, I think he was like a teacher to them. Like he kind of helped them along for a certain amount of time. Then they had to graduate to the next person. But I think by that point, they were capable of taking care of themselves. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I agree. Well, what more can you say? What a great discussion. I appreciate you gentlemen coming on today anybody have anything they would like to uh plug john just go around i let's see what have i got going on in my my little music corner um most recent thing is i i got my wife and i to do the we yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about this yeah we talked about the top five muppet movie songs so there you go gotta go you go from rush to the muppets so Go figure, but uh, Why not? Uh, to watch uh, that was a lot. Of, that was actually a lot of fun. Uh, my wife really knocked it out of the park. I thought, um, <clears throat> you know, not being the uh, quite the music person that I am, uh, and so uh, I think she did a great job. So now I can now that opens up the door for me to now to do uh, something on the channel with with you guys or or anybody else who's who's uh, brave enough to step into my little music corner so uh I say, that was my this, let's get this rolling john yeah we get i've got i know i've got some ideas i'm throwing out to everybody so i'm gonna try and get some uh, hopefully get some time to, to do to really prepare for it but that's pretty much what i've got i think that uh that was my most recent one so uh that was a lot of fun so so everybody <laughs> need probably could get a beverage because ryan's gonna have a whole list of mentions so if you want to just grab a drink glass and maybe sit back a little bit and then relax and enjoy this all right ryan you're up well um where do i start so (laughs) um yeah well i guess we'll start selfishly i have a channel called ryan's final destination and it's also a fine one at that thank you yeah and it's also a facebook page and instagram page as well youtube channel we've had a ton of content coming out um right now we have series about aerosmith it's called rocks and ruts actually grant will be recording with me tonight as we talk about done with mirrors and permanent vacation um have a genesis series right now that 
everybody on the screen has been on at least once. And so this Wednesday, we're going to be recording a video about Three Sides Live and the Shapes album. Uh, just put out a video recently about Joni Mitchell. We compared her albums Hissing the Summer Lawns and Court and Spark. Um, and then I just, you know, I write stuff on my Facebook page um, and on Instagram. I write stuff for Sea of Tranquility. I do reviews for them. Then some other good channels to check out would be Rock Fantasy, who I'm going to be on tomorrow, actually. Oh, um, Rock Daydream Nation. Um, Tim's Vinyl Confession, Sea of Tranquility, Contrarians, which we're all part of. Um, and, you know, there's tons of other ones out there. I put them at every single one of my videos. I put all the channels to check out. So if I forgot any right now, then you'll find them there. I forgot to mention uh, Peter uh, from Rock Day Dream Nation and I, we, we actually did a uh, top five songs from the first Wasp album. That, we did a video for that. You it hasn't, did? We, wow. we did. We have it. He hasn't released it. He did it for his channel. Yeah. Uh, but we we did. We talked about the first Wasp album, and uh, so uh, we. I don't know when he's uh, when he's going to release that, but uh, that that is in the can at some point. So I I, I forgot to mention that. So you know, John, I have never heard any Wasp, and so maybe we should do like a a Wasp discovery video or something like. Yeah. First impressions. Yeah. If anybody should be doing a WAP sh wasp show, it should be you, John. Oh, there should be more than I've already, I, I have. I have a, I have a journey with wasp video. I have done that. That is on my channel, but I would love to, I would love to have a discussion on a wasp album with, with anybody. I, you yeah. Know, uh, well, I'd have to brush up on it a bit. I've been yeah. listening to them a little bit. I would love to do a video. Headless children. There you go. Good stuff, Ryan. I see. I knew he had a lot. He would have a lot to list. I condensed it a little bit. Too. Yeah, but I don't know how you keep up with all of it because I can barely keep up with stuff right now. Now Todd, we know how people. Oh. Now we know how Pete Pardo feels. <laughs> well, I don't know. We might be busier than Pete. Um, Todd, <laughs> what do you got? Is there anything you want to mention? Just occasional appearances on uh, the Contrarians, uh, Ryan's Vinyl Destination, of course, and uh, Peter Kerr's uh, Rock Day Dream Nation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I can go into a little bit of what's coming up. So. Oh, I my, forgot to say Grant's Rock Warehouse. Exactly. Where, yeah. where Todd and I have an ongoing series about Matthew Sweet. There's going to be fact, more too. Oh, there's going to be a lot more because we're going to start <coughs> looking at all his records. But uh, in the beginning of May, we're going to do a top 10 Matthew Sweet tracks. That'll be nice. And other shows that are coming up, we're going to do uh, share three obscure albums everyone should have in their collection. <coughs> That's going to be recording in May. These are all things coming down the line in May. Um, top five surf, surf music tracks, which Ooh. I'm going to do with Reed. That'll be good. No one will watch it, but it'll be fun to talk some surf. I'll watch it. Okay. I will. If anybody else wants to get involved, let me know. Right now, it's just me and Reed. So, um, maybe done. One of the other ones: nineteen seventy bands that have entered the that entered the eighties gracefully, and the ones who didn't. Other bands, which kind of reminds me of the Aerosmith series, though I won't. I don't know if they're entering the eighties gracefully yet because well, we're just really getting into that stuff. So. Yeah, we'll find out we'll later see. tonight. And then on Peter Kerr's channel, I'm doing a video. I don't know who else is on that, but we're looking at the the um, infected album. Oh, and then we're looking. There's another Peter Kerr one. We're doing David Bowie, um, Aladdin versus um, Ziggy. Ziggy. I'm on that one. Okay, I can't remember when that is, but that's coming up. And of course, you know, doing videos with Ryan, Ryan and I almost, we're just cranking these things out. 
I was talking to Marco the other day, you know, what, and it made a comment. I said, Marco, I can barely keep track of what's going on right now. He thinks we're like a machine, <laughs> but it's so much fun talking about this stuff. It is it's a great outlet. It's a great, it's outlet. such a great outlet. Who am especially... I going to talk? No one around here is going to talk to me about this stuff. With... No one's going to talk to me. You know, <laughs> same here. I finally have all this mother. information I can share that is, it's all worthless, but <laughs> it's great that we can all join and share and discuss. It's just a blast. I love it. Yeah. So this was a great discussion. I appreciate each one of you coming on and wrapping this with me. It's just Thanks for been, having us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to doing some more shows. And John, I congratulate you on your show you did with your wife. I, I'll have to check it out, brush up on my Muppets. Um, That's great. But I hope you start putting some more content out. Because I would love to see, and you too, Todd, for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> no, I'm really looking forward to hopefully we can all collaborate and talk some more music. It's just so exciting. You know, make our own media empire. Well, that's what it, I'm thinking. It's just good for the soul. <laughs> it's good for the soul. So, anyway, I'm going to end this. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Please subscribe, hit all those buttons. I don't know, whatever. Enjoy, leave comments share this that. with people i'd like to get up to at least 50 subscribers you know yeah. i know it takes time but oh definitely it's all good so gentlemen i'm going to stop recording if i can figure out where that is <laughs> hold on oh there it is all right good night everybody <laughs>